We have to remember that even before the pandemic, we were besieged, bombarded by bad news continuously. I don't have to remind you, it was like we were on a drip feed of one disaster and then another one came. It's almost like it became an addiction because, well, you know, part of us is a savage. I'm sorry. You know, and I wrote a book about that thinking my last book that we were pretty much reptilian, but I agree with Rutka now, I made a mistake. I think that we're born with, I could never say the C word, but with compassion. And uh, the proof of that is a mother um, can only grow a baby's brain through that kind of bond, that love, that oxytocin. So the rage comes later. Anyway, back to my book, which is more important. Um, Ruby? Yeah? Can you adjust the screen a tiny bit down? Yes. Oh, thank you. Did you just see the top of my head? Yes, just for that few minutes. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks for telling me. It's important to see me. Anyway, so um, what I always knew is that wherever I put my, and I, actually it's true, wherever you put your attention, where you focus your attention defines who you are in that, in that moment. And you start to get habits of just seeing the world through that lens. And I thought, come on, Ruby, let's pull away, pull away from the bad news and just start to focus on the good news out there. And I don't mean, you know, something frilly, somebody suddenly decided to save a parrot. I mean, let's find those innovators who are reinventing, um, you know, tech, the new paradigm for tech, business, education, community, food, health. And um, so believe me, there are green shoots spouting up there. And um, it made me I've done it for the last three years. I was searching for them. Actually, I finished the book the night um, the lock-in started. So that's why it's called, and now for the good news. I didn't know. Anyway, uh, there are green shoots spouting that make me, in, that have made me incredibly happy and it does give me hope. And I hope it does the same for you. So we don't all have to start packing our bags and go to Mars. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Musk, but we're not. But the theme that runs through all of my chapters each one of them is that the only way and the only way we're going to make it is by working as a team. I mean, we have to go back to the old days, not that long ago, where we were in community. I mean, that's when humans were at our best. Well, that's when we were at our best. I mean, we knew what to do back hundreds of thousands of years ago. We'd all hunker down around the fire, you know, after a hard day hunting and take care of each other. I mean, obviously not the guy who was eaten, but we take care of each other and make each other feel safe. I mean, but now families have dispersed. Mm -hmm. um, most town halls are empty and we are now hunkered, even though we think we're so connected, all in our little corners once in a while, sending out a tweet like a flare from the sinking Titanic. But we've lost the plot, humans. We've lost the point of us. And it turns out the point of us is to mingle. I mean, part of the problem is we live at a time now where success is worshiped above all else, to be a winner at all costs. But I just want to say something quickly here that I thought this was interesting, that Darwin didn't mean survival of the fittest was survival of the most uh, aggressive and savage and driven. He meant those who cooperate the best survive the longest. By the way, the person who coined survival of the fittest was a guy called uh, Herbert Spencer in the 19th century to convince people that human beings were built to compete and fight. It was poverty that stopped progress. And inevitably, if you have a winner, there has to be a loser. And then industrialists jumped on it to justify their greed and went all the way up to Gordon Gecko saying greed is good and nobody argued. Anyway, that's how we've been living. And I think it's paid, well, it's, <laughs> it's reaped havoc to say the least. Um, there is a chapter called community and I went to visit several well many communities in the cities with their how they're doing city planning now so that uh, they're making the journey uh, more interesting than actually getting to your destination so there's little nubs you know little hubs where people can meet and there's parks that push people together if you want to but you know we're always on the way somewhere I mean again our god is busyness so that, you know, it is in the architecture, we can push people together. 
but there are things called intentional eco communities and um, there's about 10,000 of them. I went to some. Uh, some of them are really snazzy. They're in New York. Um, some There's some African in Cape Town. There's a few. Some favelas have turned into eco communities and their mission is the same wherever they are, is that they work together and they're dedicated to not harming the environment. And when they have meetings, which they have quite a lot because everybody has to be heard, the ethos is equality, transparency, and authenticity. And um, by the way, there is one in South London, an eco community. It's free housing. You know, people always say, oh, you need so much money. It's free housing. The Peabody Trust put up the money. Uh, there's no heating bills and they really know how to conserve energy. Then they share a vegetable garden, right? And they give the food, either they take it or they give the rest to food banks. And then there's a community center and that's what we're missing where, you know, if you have a baby, you can hand it to other mothers and they can take care of the baby and the elderly have cooking classes and yoga and it just oozed happiness. Um, there, and there's cobblestone streets between the buildings. Again, the architecture is pushing people together. So the kids are safe because they can play between the buildings. I wanted to live there immediately. And then I went into education to find out where the green shoots are there. Of course, I stole a lot from Alex Beard, who's Daisy's husband. Uh, he wrote the um, New Learners and I went to Finland following in his footsteps. And yes, it is, it is the model of great, of great education. The teachers, by the way, are paid more than most jobs. So that's just a clue of how they revere the teachers. But just to bring it back again, I did go uh, to a couple of schools in the UK. Um, they're called Reach to the ones I went to visit and they're state schools. It's for kids uh, 11, sorry, five to 11. And they're all in very violent neighborhoods and they all come from disadvantaged homes and with terrible academic results. But I watched the teachers, they teach those kids empathy and they learn how to focus their attention without distraction because we live in a culture surrounded by weapons of mass distraction. So they really teach the kids, you know, to to cool down their cortisol because they're they're constant as we are in a fight and flight state. So they have tools that they give these kids. For example, when they're in a class, they go to a corner if they feel themselves agitated, and there's a a red red color, yellow, green, and if they're in the red zone, they have breathing balls, you know, little things that help them get back into the green zone. And when they feel themselves calm, this means they are regulating their own emotions. Then they take the exam. And by the way, the results have gone off the chart. And um, they go around in a circle sometimes and say, what do they find uh, special about the person next to them? And some kid said to me, oh, I'm just, he didn't know who I am, just happy that you're here. And they're assigned a buddy. So there is a kind of family that they have. And um, the other thing that I really loved is there is no such thing as a stupid question. So I would have flourished there because those kids um, are gonna think out of the box. They don't, they can eliminate low self-esteem and the stupider the question, the better the grade. Because let's face it anyway, I think it's 80% of eight-year-olds now there will be jobs for 80% that don't even exist now. I hope that made sense. And at the end of the day, 600 of the school came together and they sang to me, um, what song did they sing? Oh, A Million Miles, which I can't stand, but I wept and I don't cry because you know I'm on antidepressants, but I wept. Anyway, these are the kids that I hope make the future better. And then I don't know if I have time, I went to business. Um, to one chapters on business and just to read you, my dad was a killer, my father, who took no prisoners um, in either his private or business life. He passed his wisdom to me, which was screw them before they screw you, was very lovingly said. And if you ever ripped my father off, he would hunt you down and leave a kind of greeting card that that guy did in The Godfather where he put a horse's head in bed with the guy who owed him money. <laughs> that was my dad's technique. So I didn't really trust um, people in business, um, you know, especially now some of them are trying to do the right thing, you know, they're greenwashing, they put, putting a wind machine in the men's loo to replace the hand dryer and probably giving bonuses to people who don't flush the toilet. So I don't trust business at all. But I have seen it with my own eyes. And that's, there's a phoenix rising out of the old economic model called conscious capitalism. 
And there are businesses now, believe it or not, that are motivated by purpose and not by profit. So for example, and there's lots of them, but I did go to, it's a sportswear company called Patagonia in Ventura, California. Although I fell in love with the man who started it. It's like, you know, kind of a cowboy. But they started it about 40 years ago. And um, there's a book about Patagonia and it's called Let My People Go Surfing. It'll tell you about it. Each employee chooses a charity that he wants to get involved in. So in the last 30 years, they've given away 10% of all profits. They've given away, um, I think they all pool together and they give away um, $100 million already uh, to over 2,500 environmental groups. And 95% of what they made is they make now is recycled material. They gave me a sweater and it's made out of plastic bottles. And I'm not kidding, they had sunglasses made out of fishing nets. And, and whenever you buy something at Patagonia, they have an ad in New York papers that say, don't buy anything else from us. They just, uh, they say, if, you, if anything gets damaged, send it to us and we'll repair it. So everybody, of course, trusts them. They told me a woman called and said her fleece that she had was peed on by her cat. Could she have it replaced? And the guy at the call center said, sure. What kind of cat would you like? <laughs> anyway, don't, their business quadruples every um. I think every decade, but anyway, so it's it's not like it's a small little, you know, out of place company that doesn't make a profit. And what's happening now is certain companies are now getting something called a B certificate. It's called B Corps. And it, they give it to businesses that have the highest standards of verified social and environmental performance, public transparency, and legal accountability to balance profit and purpose. And their whole remit is to bring humanity back to business. And just so you don't think it's Patagonia, but Unilever have, for example, within Unilever, they have Ben and Jerry's who um, they're, give a lot of work to refugees. Um, there's Dove Soap, where they work with girls with body dysmorphia. There's, um, you know, there are people starting to walk the talk. I mean, people will go, oh, well, but, well, but somebody's, <laughs> somebody's trying. And I think companies will have to change because they're going to be apps pretty soon. You'll be able to put them over. I'm, I'm sure they're there already, but you'll be able to get the data of the hidden impacts of what of what you're buying. So you can figure out who's got arthritis, you know, from sewing in the zipper of your jeans or how old the kid actually was who put the rubber on your running shoes. And once we find the wrongdoers, I think this really exists, is we could just tweet the bad guys you know, with a this sucks and this rules hashtag. Anyway, I've heard some of the millennials saying uh, giving is the new taking. And then just to finish it off uh, in tech, believe it or not, they're creating games now for kids, which teach the kids empathy, but the games are still fun. Um, I know when uh, a rocket crashes on a, on a planet and they don't speak, obviously the alien and the kid don't speak the same language, but through facial gestures, they form a friendship. And if uh, the alien picks up anger, it reacts with anger. So the kid really learns how to, how to bond and how to, well, make a relationship work. Otherwise they're never getting off the planet. And then at the end of the book, I, I pick out some charities that really, I think um, are changing the world. I know there's lots of them out there, but I just picked three and one was, uh, the charity called Choose Love Indigo, and I went with them to uh, work with the refugees in Samos, and it, these girls that run it, they look like I did when I was 18. They're completely full of hope, and I got to Samos, and I, you know, what can I give? This is a pathetic thing, and um, <laughs> so um, I'm facing these women who, what can I say? Um, you know, there was a really pretty one called Princess. She had purple you know, purple uh, dreadlocks, you know, they get a, a cup of water at this much a month or something. And she used it to wash her hair. And she's really pretty. And, um, you know, you ask, how did she get there? And she said, well, when she was in Somalia, her husband made a video of a riot and then put it to music. And the police came and said, could we have that video? And um, he said, no, I don't have it. And they shot her daughter right in front of her. And you continuously hear those stories. I, I'm so embarrassed of what I did. 
you know, they liked that I was just there. And um, I said, would you like to have a Pilates class tomorrow? This is pathetic. And so they came. They came and uh, I, we, I did some sit-ups. And then I said, uh, listen, that's enough. These, these are probably tiring you. <laughs> and then I realized these people had carried their luggage and their families on their heads from the Congo. You know, what was I thinking? And then I got them all manicures. And I know it sounds shallow, but um, <laughs> I'm going back. I mean, part of the reason I wrote this book is to get ideas on how I can re reinvent my life because I do a lot of reinvention. And I thought maybe the experience I have and the people I meet would help me change, you know, change my life in some way, you know, give it more meaning, give it more meaning. Because I'm so sick of those dinner parties or places where people are yapping, yapping about how awful the world is. And so I was always thinking, well, get off the pot or shut up. The pot, by the way, is elect in America. It's the loo get off or shut up. So I've now personally gotten off the pot. <laughs> I'm, I am in a uh, eco community and I, I do the vegetables every morning. I've learned to hoe. This is a woman who never touched dirt. Even my garden at home, I, I, may, I planted plastic flowers. So I'm out there hoeing and I'm picking, I have to pick the green stuff out of the kale and I've never been this happy. And um, what I love here is that they walk the talk. I mean, there's solar paneling everywhere. There's turf on the roofs of some of the homes to hold in the heat. There's biomass heaters, wood chip fuel, fuel, fuel boilers. Waste is turned into clear water and a rubbish, um, there's a rubbish bin where they boil your rubbish and recycle, recycle it into fertilized soil. So out of your own shit, you can grow gardens. So, I, you know, all those words that we're always trying to be so hip and environmental, but we don't know what the words mean. So I think I understand what sustainability is now if you, anyway, the main thing is, is that um, all of these companies really move me. They're, they're working on kindness, compassion is what's gonna make us survive. We're capable, capable of it, we're born with it. That's how the world gets healed. Compassion is also a virus and we pass it like a contagious, it's, it's contagious. And so we can infect each other with this kindness. And that's when humans are at their finest. So thank you very much.